My name is Peter Lupton, Dr. Peter Lupton, and I am going to give a presentation today concerning the body-mind problem, which is uh, a problem uh, both Sir Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles uh, focused on in their book, The Self and Its Brain, uh, published back in the last century. But it has uh, a lot of uh, implications for the future of technology and the uh, idea of conscious computers that is very topical today. Uh, it is a problem that has been waiting for a solution for at least uh, 3,000 years. And I propose to uh, demonstrate that it, it cannot be solved, but that in itself is a solution and one with uh, ramifications uh, affecting the uh, development of artificial intelligence, the, um, the uh, idea of um, ethics of artificial intelligence, and even the, uh, the problem of whether we may or may not be Boltzmann's brains and not really existing at all, which of course would be a rather a disturbing uh, thought for many people which this uh, talk can uh, put maybe some minds at rest that that would not be possible. So I'm going to begin. Um, the uh, philosophical monists and dualists have debated monist and dualist solutions to the body-mind problem, but Sir Karl Popper and uh, Sir John Eccles proposed a pluralist account at least since the philosopher René Descartes first mused cogito ergo sum, humans have puzzled over the dilemma of how it is that tissue inside the vaults of our craniums can create the wonders we experience as consciousness. Descartes proposed what is known as a dualist solution. There is a separation between the res extensa of our bodies and the res cogitans of our thoughts. Others, styled monists, have proposed that there is no separation, that our thoughts spring directly from the biochemistry of our neurons, and that the distinction between body and mind that we experience is illusory. In The Self and Its Brain, Sir Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles argued for dualism, but specifically insisting that consciousness must causally affect the brain, driving its activity. They noted, that if it made no difference to the brain's functionality, it couldn't have evolved. Popper predicted that some increase in understanding of how consciousness interacts with the body could be obtained by studying its interaction with world three, the world of objective knowledge, thus rendering a pluralist account. What elements need to be present in any solution to the problem? Well, uh, Popper added three predictions about our understanding of the nature of the body-mind interaction. One, that physics may need to be open to a new discovery affecting the first law of thermodynamics. Two, if physical determination is true, everything we think we're doing is an illusion. And three, of the development of conscious mind, there are things which at least uh, look now as if they are eternal mysteries. This paper speculates on a solution to the problem that satisfies all four of Popper's predictions. How does consciousness work? Consciousness is an emergent property of a neurological facility that in order to survive, must blend our experienced perceptions with the signals of internal homeostasis. It must match these with prior expectations apprehend the nature of problems, rank them for urgency, and solve them based on an analysis that has some form of representation of the self in the world. To do this, the brain creates a metaphorical surround sound movie that Daniel Dennett called the Cartesian theater. This must transpire without the benefit of a little man or homunculus to view the scene from within, since the homunculus in turn would need a homunculus and an infinite regress. In the words of Antonio Damasio, the sense of self 
in the act of knowing emerges within the movie. Self-awareness is actually part of the movie, thus it creates the scene and the seer, the thought and the thinker, with no separate spectator for the movie in the brain. Our conscious experience is the homunculus. It is rapidly supplied with pertinent information in a format that is readily understood. So in effect, we're left with the question, not why do we have consciousness, but what possible alternative way of experiencing the world could there be? But what is the point of consciousness, you may ask? But then we ask, why do we need to experience the world consciously? Why did it evolve? We could imagine a world in which we had no more consciousness than a sophisticated machine. In such a world, we could reason that it was time to seek food or shelter and that we had to earn money to pay for these, but we could not reason or imagine in the absence of the sensations of pleasure, reward, love, and enjoyment, that it is time to seek romance, perform an act that will lead to the birth of children, or to take care of those children afterwards. Consciousness, therefore, is not only the result of Darwinian selection for self-preservation, but also the result of sexual selection for the emotional package that leads to reproduction. This leads to our third question, consciousness is a very neat trick, but how does the brain pull it off? Is the universe conscious? David Chalmers, himself a dualist, posited a psychological law of the universe to bridge the explanatory gap in our understanding of consciousness. Presumably, for a few billion years after the Big Bang, until solar systems formed capable of sustaining intelligent life, this psychological law tagged along with gravity and electromagnetism without doing anything. Known as panpsychism, this theory fails to give consciousness a causative power over the brain's actions. I do not feel that such a mystical principle is necessary. Rather, I believe that the law of entropy, plus the uncertainty inherent in emergence, can account for consciousness. Living organisms are islands of reduced entropy in their environments. Consciousness further reduces the entropy of the world, for instance, leading to purpose-built structures. The entropy of consciousness, which emerges as output from our brain's activity, is less than the totality of the brain's unprocessed sensory inputs, which is what makes the brain interesting. However, the processes themselves, the uncertainty associated with them, and the seeming impossibility of our being able to understand them guarantees that entropy will favor the evolution of consciousness. What is the link between entropy, information, and consciousness? Well, according to the physicist John Wheeler, information is fundamental to the physics of the universe. And if physical laws could be recast in informational terms, they may become congruent with Chalmers' psychological law. The amount of information in a message is proportional to its length in characters or digits. Likewise, Boltzmann's equations describe entropy as the number of digits of probability in a system and it represents the possible combination of activity that we are ignorant of. The more certain an event is, the less surprising it will be and the less information it will contain. A gain in information, in this context, knowledge is the opposite of information, is an increase in the uncertainty or entropy. Increased entropy is associated with an increased number of microstates within a macrostate, where microstates are invisible subunits of a perceived macrostate that can be arranged differently within it. If we are about to toss a coin or roll a die, there is no information about the outcome and zero entropy in this system. Rolling the die increases the entropy more than does a coin toss because there are more 
possible outcomes. It creates more surprise in the result and more disorder in the world. More facts, including, including possible results that didn't happen for us to keep track of. The information states can refer to the possible arrangements of sand grains on a beach or atoms in a jar for practical purpose, impossible to apprehend. Entropy is the amount of missing information needed to determine what specific microstate your system is in. How information is described by the law of thermodynamics is the next question. The term information has meanings at different levels, which could be confused, especially regarding the analogy between information and entropy. Considering isolated systems, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It is believed that the same applies to information. The second law states that entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease. It inevitably tends to increase until the system reaches equilibrium. If the amount of information is proportional to the entropy, then this means that the amount of information too must increase. Yet as we have seen, it cannot be created. Sean Carroll in The Big Picture explained that information which is conserved is that of the microstate made up of the positions and momenta of particles, not the information in the system's macrostate of which we might or might not have knowledge and which can be destroyed. Information is subject to a quantum law of conservation. Therefore, a book full of classical level information can be incinerated in a fire, which will increase the entropy of the macrostate, but not that of all the scattered atoms in the microstate. This is because the atoms the, the, in the smoke and in the ash could theoretically be retraced to their original positions in the book, which thus conserves information at the level of the microstate, even as we know that this will never happen. Likewise, the question of what happens to all the information in our brains after we die is exactly analogous to what happens to the book in the fire. How can we reconcile the first and second law of thermodynamics? This explains how information is not destroyed, but how is it not created? I suggest that someone who knew the trajectories of all the relevant particles before the book was burnt would know the precise microscopic information that was about to be increased by the transformation of printed paper into smoke and ash. Since they would be able to predict what would happen next, the information of this system is thus increased without being created. This reconciles the first and second laws, but it requires that the future course of all atoms and particles be predetermined by our knowledge of the system at present. A different theory suggests that information is related to, but not equivalent to entropy. What is conserved is some combination of the two with one increasing as the other decreases. Given the pervasiveness of chaotic indeterminism in the universe, for instance, as described by Ilya Predrigin in his The End of Certainty, I believe this interpretation to be the more fruitful approach. How is knowledge computed and what are the physics involved with computation? Observing and memorizing the result of any increase in classical level information, and hence entropy, has the effect of decreasing one's own personal entropy. It creates knowledge that can be used to do work. However, the acquisition, subconscious and conscious processing, communication and storage of information as knowledge is the result of energy intensive neuronal activity, which increases entropy. Even the act of calculating what to do increases entropy. 
Computation requires a temporary storage of information upon which the calculator or mind acts in order to perform the calculation. It cannot be stored indefinitely and its erasure in order to proceed to the next calculation increases entropy. According to Landauer's principle, any logical irreversibly, uh, irreversible computation, such as destroying information, represents work resulting in a small non-zero heat loss, which increases entropy. How does entropy compensate for the emergence of information? Computations creating conscious knowledge from information decrease entropy. This is mirrored in the organization we impose on the world around us. This decrease in entropy must be balanced by the simultaneous increase in the entropy or our ignorance of the possible microstates of consciousness. This entropy being significantly high, the likelihood of our ever understanding them becomes correspondingly small. I propose emergent non-predictable systems involve the destruction of microscopic information and the uncertainty about them is the result of entropy. An emergent increase in the microscopic information is by definition not predictable, unlike the situation with the book in the fire. I believe to avoid the consequent creation of information confounding the first law, the increased entropy occurs with the simultaneous destruction of the computational paths involved. This destroys an equivalent amount of information, allowing the first and second laws to be reconciled during emergence. Would this necessitate a new physical law or principle? If my reasoning is valid, I believe this can be stated as a new law of thermodynamics. The increase in entropy in a time irreversible, unpredictable, emergent, closed system requires the simultaneous permanent deletion of information concerning the steps or computations involved. It says, in effect, that to increase information without creating it, the creative process must be deleted simultaneously with the creation of it. This new law seems to be, to be necessary to explain emergent phenomena without violating the quantum conservation of information law. I will use the example of Maxwell's demon to relate this to the emergence of consciousness. How does this play out in the brain? James Clark Maxwell imagined a demon that could defeat entropy by effortlessly opening a trap door between two chambers in a box and allowing fast air molecules to collect on one side. This would create an engine perpetually able to perform work. However, as Landauer showed, the demon was thwarted because each time it opened the door, it collected information that could not be stored indefinitely. Therefore, information ultimately had to be erased at the end of each cycle as the demon prepared to open the door again. According to Landauer's principle, the irretrievable loss of information would be associated with heat loss that would reduce the system's ability to do work. It increased entropy enough to counter the decrease in entropy that accompanied the movement of the atoms to one side. Similarly, to increase the level of order in the world gained by our becoming conscious, entropy must simultaneously increase through the loss of certainty associated with the unpredictable process. This occurs through the destruction of that portion of the information that we would need to reconstruct the process of emergence. When Maxwell's demon opens the gate between our subconscious and our consciousness, the information that is erased is that describing the pathway of how consciousness emerges. Conversely, whatever is going on in our neurons to generate consciousness must be accompanied by an irreversible, unpredictable process that converts our thoughts into actual instructions to move muscles, one that neurons can follow. This could be called a process of convergence. 
I'll say this in conclusion. The emergence and convergence of a consciousness are hidden deep within the computational workings of the brain by the inescapable tyranny of entropy and its irreversible tendency towards increasing diversity and disorder. However, we can say that the situation is not consistent with simple monism, but is effectively compatible with a causative interactive dualism in which consciousness can be controlled by the brain, but which is at a hidden level monist. There is no need for the explanatory gap to be bridged by panpsychism. We must return to the question, what possible alternative way of experiencing the world could there be? I propose that it will never be possible to characterize consciousness more descriptively than that. Popper was correct to predict that the mystery of consciousness would never be more than partially understood by science. And in fact, if we can't understand consciousness ourselves, we can't program it into future computers that will therefore become conscious and and maybe even able to incorporate models of ourselves, which uh, means that we are actually within those computers and not existing in the way that we think we do. And furthermore, it also implies that deep into the far uh, recesses of the uh, dying universe, uh, trillions of years from now, uh, that there will not be able to arise conscious Boltzmann's brains uh, in infinite numbers, which uh, would mean that we would almost certainly be a Boltzmann's brain. None of this could be possible if nothing can be conscious except those things which have evolved uh, through their uh, evolutionary history as living organisms uh, for the purpose mainly of uh, hoping to be able to understand the uh, need to reproduce. Uh, so these things will be conscious, but nothing else. I conclude that the body-mind problem will be solved only after all the world's broken eggs reassemble themselves and all the world's toothpaste squeezes itself back into the tubes because we otherwise would be having to defy entropy. Thank you.